God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And welcome to another Wednesday evening virtual broadcast of Bible study, virtual Bible study here with the New Hope Baptist Church here in Covington, Georgia. We thank God for all of you who are here and who are sharing this video live, sharing with us and those of you who will be uh, seeing it later on through various mediums of Facebook uh, and uh, YouTube. We thank God for another opportunity be able to just come and share with you uh, the word of God. Well, listen, uh, it's a new day, and we just thank God for, uh, for uh, this opportunity. Now, it's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. August the 4th, 2021. And we've been dealing with this COVID-19 virus for over a year and a half. And things are still going uh, pretty hectic. In fact, um, there's a new variant that seems to be taking the country by storm, the Delta variant. But what I understand is more, even more deadly than the original variant. And uh, we just want you to be careful. Uh, please, ma'am. Please, sir, do your research, uh, get vaccinated, protect yourself, protect your neighbors, uh, because we need to, to do what we can uh, to get this virus under control. Well, listen, as we come tonight, we are praying for the Lester Lackey family. Yes, Lester Lackey of Lester Lackey and Sons Funeral Home. We are praying for his family, uh, Damon Lackey, his son. Uh, died this past Sunday. So we're lifting up uh, the Lackey family in our prayers. As uh, far as I know, there, there has been no uh, uh, final arrangements made yet, uh, but uh, we're lifting them up in our prayers. We're also lifting up the prayers. We're lifting up the family of Sheriff Lee Vance of the Hines County Sheriff Department uh, in Hines County, Mississippi. Um, 
Sheriff Vance died today of COVID-19 there in Jackson, Mississippi. And so we're lifting up the Hines County Sheriff's Department, uh, the Jackson Police Department, because at one time, uh, Sheriff Vance was uh, captain or chief of police for Jackson. And so we're lifting the citizens of Newton County. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, the citizens of Hines County, uh, the citizens of Jackson, Mississippi, citizenry of the state of Mississippi. Uh, Sheriff Vance was a, was a great man. And we just thank God for the service that he gave. We're lifting, we're lifting up his family. And we pray that his blessing, his, uh, his uh, memory will be blessed. Well, tonight, uh, just want to announce also that, uh, you know, last Sunday was our first in-service after the, uh, our first in-service uh, um, from a long time, over a year and a half. And uh, I think the service turned out well. Uh, we were in and out in about, 45 minutes or so. And so we're going to be doing that again this coming Sunday in service. Um, we're going to try to be in and out in an hour. We ask that you wear your mask, that you practice social distancing. Uh, there'll be temperature checks at the door. If you're feeling sick or you're feeling ill, please, ma'am, please, sir, do not attend. Well, tonight, uh, as we get ready for our study, we're going to be talking about uh, what's wrong with what this verse means to me. And we're going to be doing a study of the importance of proper biblical interpretation, proper biblical interpretation. And so as we prepare for that, uh, let's go now to the Lord in prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, O God, even right now. We thank you, God, for this privilege and this opportunity. We just come now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, for being a merciful God. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, God, for just being the God you are. Father, we ask now that you forgive us of our many sins, our sins of omission, as well as our sins of commission. We pray, oh God, that you would just uh, continue to be with us and to lead us and guide us. We lift up now, God, uh, the various families that are going through sickness and going through bereavement. We especially lift up to you the Lackey family, uh, Brother Lester Lackey and the staff of the Lester Lackey and Sons Funeral Home. We lift up uh, uh, Sister Lackey as, she, as they deal with the passing of Demond Lackey, oh God. We just lift them up to you. They have cared for so many families in their hour of bereavement, and now is their time. So God, we ask that you just comfort them as only you can. We pray, oh God, for uh, the family of Sheriff Lee Vance as they deal with his sudden passing today uh, there in Jackson, Mississippi. We pray, God, for his wife, his family, and uh, the Sheriff Department and the whole citizenry of Hines County and in Jackson, Mississippi. That you just lift them up, oh God, as, and, and bear them up on your wings and comfort them as only you can. Not only them, God, but their other families, too many to name, that are going through similar situations with the death of loved ones and with sickness. We pray, oh God, for our nation. Uh, give our national leaders wisdom as they seek to uh, legislate and guide us and govern us. We pray, oh God, that they'll be able to do it in peace, but that will be beneficial to all. Uh, we pray, oh God, for, for those who, who may not know you as Lord and Savior, God, that you just reach and touch them, and that we'll do our part uh, to be ambassadors for you. Now, God, give us uh, listening ears as we seek to uh, study your word tonight, that we may be able to more intelligently and more accurately uh, interpret and thereby apply your word to our lives. This we pray now in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, God bless you. Again, as we said earlier tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, what's wrong with what this verse means to me? We're going to be talking about a proper biblical interpretation, a proper biblical 
interpretation of the Bible. And that's important uh, because uh, as we study the word of God, we need to be aware that oftentimes the Bible may not say what we think it says. And often the reason for that is because we often look at the Bible, as I read in the book, through Western eyes, that the Bible is the Eastern book. And so you have to understand that as you study the Bible, we're, we're, we're studying um, concepts, we're studying people, we're studying ideas that originated in a different time in a much different culture than our own. And so I thought it's important because there's so much going on today where there is mis, uh, misrepresentation and misinterpretation of the biblical text. And so uh, that's why we want to do this study tonight. What's wrong with what this verse means to me? A study of the importance of proper biblical interpretation. And I got that because that, that title, because it reminds me of when I was a little boy uh, growing up in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And I remember attending Sunday school so well. And the teacher would have us to read a, a verse. And then she would say, well, you know, little Harold, what does this verse mean to you? What does this verse mean to you? And, and that's how I got started. <laughs> excuse me, on biblical interpretation. But I found out later that that was not really the most important question, what does this verse mean to me? Because that's not where we need to start. So let's talk about what's wrong with that. What's wrong with that? Well, it's wrong to approach the biblical text first seeking the meaning of the text for you because, number one, the Bible was not written to you. The Bible was not written to you. You know, when we read the Bible, when you read the Bible, when I read the Bible, we are reading someone else's mail. Listen, not only was the Bible not written to you, authors, to, to write, and to give uh, an account of what he had given them, he did it through their own personality. They were not timeless robots. They were not machines. They were not devoid of their culture. They wrote in the context within which they lived. It was not like, you know, just, uh, they were not just, impersonal dictating machine or dictation machine. So the Bible was written in specific times, places and cultures, all of which must be considered if we are to accurately and honestly interpret the text. Let me say that again. We have to take into account the Pacific times, places, and cultures. We must take all that into account if we are to accurately and honestly interpret the text. Because we, it, it, was, it was not written in a vacuum, okay? So let's do a little comparison and contrast just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Let's compare and contrast. See, we live in a modern Western industrialized technical world. The Bible, the people in the Bible live in an ancient Eastern agricultural world. In the modern West, particularly in the United States, there's a great stress focuses on the individual 
an individual freedom and opportunity. However, in the ancient East, and even in the modern East today, the focus was not on the individual, but rather was on the group. The individual freedoms and rights we so fervently insist upon were completely unknown in the ancient Eastern world. Now, while there are consistent similarities down throughout the ages of human nature, human action, uh, it is really a fundamental mistake to assume that the people of the Bible were just like us. No, they were not just like us. They didn't think like us. As I said, we, we think individual. You know, this, this, this concept that we talk about as having Jesus as our personal savior, that's not in the Bible. That's a foreign concept. That's a, that's a foreign concept to the Bible because the Bible doesn't focus so much on the personal individual. It's about the group. That's the way the that's the way ancient Easterners thought. The focus was on the group. Okay. By the way, they also had a supernatural worldview. What I mean by that, uh, you know, they 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 did not reason miracles out of existence. I think one of the reasons why we don't see as many miracles today is not because God doesn't perform miracles. We don't have the faith. We think too much. We rationalize too much uh, for miracles to happen in our lives. We have to, the Bible talks about uh, coming into the kingdom as having childlike faith. We want to figure everything out. We want to figure everything out instead of just letting God do what God does. But now, when it comes to Bible interpretation, the reading of the Bible, oftentimes we start at the wrong end. As I said in my introduction, uh, most Bible readers read and study the Bible starting at the wrong end. Uh, they first seek what it means for and to them. We go to the Bible um, for answers to our questions. Uh, um, uh, solutions to our problems. We read a text and we want to know how we can apply that to our situation. You know, it's all about us. What, what does this, what is God saying to me in this verse? Well, before we can get to that, we need to go even back further. We're starting at the wrong end. Uh, my Greek professor, Dr. G. Roger Green uh, at Mississippi College would often say to us when when I was a student in his uh, New Testament uh, Greek class at Mississippi College, he said, he said, you can't tell what it means if you don't know what it meant. What he meant by that, that in order to properly apply meaning for and to us, the modern reader, we must first understand what it meant for and to the original writer and the audience. Let me just say this while we're on this page, on that page. The meaning of the text is not what it means to you. The meaning of the text is what it meant to the author who wrote it and to the people who it was written to. It's like this, if, if I were to write a letter um, and a hundred years from now, somebody you know read my letter, and of course, a hundred years from now, things will probably be different. Culture being changed, a different uh, way of speaking, per se. And so there may be some confusion as to what I meant by a certain thing. Well, in order for that person to know what I meant. I mean, it would be improper for them to just assume what I meant and say and, and, and say that I meant that when I may have meant something else, you see. So the burden, the real, uh, 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 the real truth of what I meant is, does, not rely, does not lie with that person who may read it 100 years from now. 
it lies with me. So in order for them to know what I meant, they need to get back to my culture, get back, get back to my time, I get into my mind, get, get, get what was going on today in their mind, through, through historical research or whatever, so that they may properly interpret the text the same way we need to do with the Bible. You know, it's wrong to start with where we are today and try to read back uh, our thoughts, our uh, uh, way of living, our attitude, our customs, our languages back into that time. I, and I, I, I mentioned that last week, I believe, when I talked about uh, the woman at the well. And I, and I keep harping on her because she's a prime example of how we just mis, misinterpreted the biblical text because we, we judge her based on our modern concepts of marriage instead of the, the way marriage was in her time. We, 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 we treat her as if she was a modern Western woman uh, when she was an ancient Eastern woman. And we totally misunderstood that text. And, and because we totally misunderstood that text, we, we missed the message, I believe, that Jesus was trying to apply. Because she, that, you see, there cannot be one meaning for them in a completely different meaning for us. It's so, so the important thing, the question is not what this verse means to me. The question is, what does this verse mean? In order for us to know what this verse means, we, must, we need to know what it meant to the original writer and the original reader. Now, often there is a message between the lines. In all written and oral communication, ancient and modern, by the way, there's always a message that is unspoken and unwritten. When you write a letter, when you're writing a letter to a person you are familiar with, there are some things you're going to write in that letter, and there are some things that you're not going to write, but you're going to expect, and you fully expect the person who's going to read it to already know. And because they already know, it's not necessary for you to write it. See what I'm saying? So, and what happens now, the, the message that is unspoken, and unwritten and contributes to the meaning of the communication almost as much as what is spoken and written. Now, here's the problem. The first and second party, that is the sender and the receiver, have access to this inside information, this unspoken, but is mutually understood information. But that information is always unknown to the third party or the secondary reader, which is us. So what I'm saying, I'm saying when Paul writes his letters, wrote his letters to, to the different churches, to the different individuals, uh, he knew some things, they knew some things that he didn't have to tell them or write down, that he assumed they would understand because they would, but we don't, because we don't have privy. We were not there. So in most cases now, not only does the, does the third party not have access to this inside information, but oftentimes they don't even know it exists. So you gotta understand when, you, when we read the biblical text, there's always something we don't know. And I don't care how, how much studying we do, there will always be something that we will never know because we were not there. We were not privileged. We can only go back as far as uh, scholarship and, 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 and studious and correct hermeneutical and exegetical study can take us. And that can only take us so far. But bless God, we have enough. We can know enough. Uh, for God to communicate his word to us. Here's, just a, here's, a, here's a biblical uh, example of this missing information, this concept I was just telling you about. 
This is uh, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. This is Paul writing to the uh, church at Corinth. Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all, meaning the sexually moral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to, know, need, to know, need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reveler, a drunkard, or a swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. But what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside, purge the evil person from among you. In a nutshell, now Paul is saying, he's saying, I, I, I wrote you before now, and I told you not to associate with a more, you know, sexually immoral people. But I wouldn't talk about the people out in the world, because if you don't associate with sexually immoral people, you won't be associated with anybody. He said, but these are people. Don't associate with those people in the church. Don't have fellowship with those people in the church because that's where your jurisdiction is. You can, you can judge, judge in the church. But you have no authority to judge outside of the church. That's simply what he's saying. But here's why I brought you this, brought us here. Notice this instruction is part of a letter we call first. Corinthians. Yet in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, the Apostle Paul refers to a previous letter that he had written. So we have 1 and 2 Corinthians in our Bible. But yet in 1 Corinthians, Paul makes a reference to a letter he wrote before that one. So that means that 1 Corinthians is not really 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was not the first letter to the, to the church of Corinth. Therefore, what we might actually have is 3rd and, I mean, 2nd and 3rd Corinthians. And apparently the letter that Paul first wrote was lost. And that text, if we had that first letter, no doubt it would shed some light on some of the things Paul said and what we call 1 Corinthians, just as 1 Corinthians helped shed some light on the things in 2 Corinthians. You know, and, and that's how those letters work because those letters, Paul wrote those letters in, in regard and answer to specific questions uh, that the people at that time had and they were writing to Paul. Paul was writing back to them, or they were sending messages to Paul. Paul was writing them a letter, uh, and he's addressing the specific issue they had within the church. A typical example, for instance, is, is First and Second Thessalonians. In First Thessalonians, Paul talks about the the coming of the Lord, coming of the Lord, uh, and and apparently uh, those in in Thessalonica thought the Lord was going to come first come soon, and then Paul writes them back. He says, hey, you slackers, you know, people that got work and just waiting around, waiting on the Lord. Paul writes back, hey, you know, this is what he tells them in 2 second Thessalonians, get back to work, because before the Lord comes back, X, Y, Z has to happen. So that's what he's bringing out in first and second Thessalonians. And so when we read the Bible, if there's a first, we need to read the second. You know, there's a third, we need to read the third because they all blend in together because we're getting misunderstanding if you separate one from another. So here's the case here. Paul's writing in what we call 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. He says it right there. Check it out in your Bible when you get a chance. He talks about a formal letter or a, or a letter he wrote before. So that implies that there was a letter that they knew about that we don't know about because that letter has been lost. In addition to that, 
there's always this thing of unspoken knowledge. Unspoken knowledge. Here's another biblical example of this unspoken knowledge that the people in that day and time knew that maybe we don't, but it'll help explain the text. Here in John chapter 11, verse 39, Jesus says, and he's at the grave of Lazarus. You know, Lazarus got sick. They sent word uh, to Jesus. Uh, he whom you love is sick. And the Bible says that Jesus stayed three days more uh, where he was. Okay. And finally, Jesus gets there. But Lazarus has been dead for four days by the time Jesus arrives at the tomb. And so Jesus says, to, he says, remove the stone. And then Martha, the sister of the deceased, says to him, Lord, by this time, there will be a stench. For he has been dead for days. And in the Greek text, Martha said, Lord, now he stinks, for he is a fourth day. He is a fourth day. Now, that, that, that goes right over our head as far as English, uh, modern English readers. Because to us, uh, that was just a, a detail. You know, John just writing a detail. Uh, to help us, uh, you know, fill in the details of the story. But there's a significance in that and what Martha just said. Because there was, in that day and time, a commonly held, unspoken belief that all of those who were present at the grave of Lazarus knew, but perhaps many modern readers do not know. Let me just share with you this unspoken Jewish uh, post-mortem belief. And I'm taking this uh, from the entry of, from the word biblical commentary, uh, George R. Beasley, John Murray, in volume uh, 36 on page 189, 190. This is a direct quote from that, uh, from that uh, entry. They say the news that Lazarus was now four days in the tomb indicates that he was buried on the day of his death, as was customary in Israel. But it mentions, but its mention shows that he was dead beyond all doubt. And then they give a reference here to a, a, uh, a writing that said that one should visit the burial place of a newly buried for three days to ensure the person was really dead. Uh, you know, our, our what we call weights originally were for that purpose, to make sure the person was dead. So they would visit the ancient, in ancient Israel, they would visit the person, uh, the grave for three days uh, to make sure the person was dead. Why three days? Well, uh, it was taught that the whole strength of the morning, morning is not till the third day. For three days alone, the soul returns to the grave, thinking that it will return, that is, into the body. When, however, it sees that the color of its face has changed, then it goes away and leaves it. Four days in the grave establishes that it was all over. In other words, there was a belief that the soul of the deceased hung around the grave for three days, seeking re-entry into the body. But now by the fourth day, the body begins to decompose. The face begins to change and sag. Because you got to understand, they didn't do embalming back then. The only thing they did with the body was wash not with spices and oil. They did not embalm. The Egyptians embalmed. The Jews did not. I mean, embalm, brother. The Jews did not. So by the fourth day, as hot as it was, decomposition starts setting in. You know, the skin starts sag. And, when, and so, so supposedly, when the soul sees that, it knows there's no hope of re-entering into the body. And so, 
it goes away and leaves. So in, that may be the reason why Jesus stayed where he was. Because see, he wanted them, he wanted them to know that not only did he have the power to heal the sick, but he had the power to raise the dead dead. And the fact that Lazarus was dead four days, everybody knew there was no hope. Because you see, if 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 Jesus had come back immediately, and perhaps he had got there the day after Lazarus had died. That may have been, well, you know, uh, the, the soul hangs around the grave for, for three days, so it ain't no big deal, you know, or even the second day. But after four days, they knew there was no hope. But yet, Lazarus was raised from the dead. And see, that further glorified God and the, magnim the magnanimity of that miracle. But now we missed that because that's inside information that we that most of us don't know or didn't know. Also, as we read the Bible, we need to be aware of the use of euphemisms. Euphemisms. As you read the Bible, be aware that just as we use figures of speech. There are figures of speech in the Bible. Just as we use, and euphemism is a figure of speech. Dictionary definition is the substitution of an agreeable or inoffensive expression for one that may offend or suggest something unpleasant. Uh, we do this all the time. Uh, for instance, you say, I'm going to hit the sack. It's a euphemism. It simply means go to sleep. You go to bed. He kicked the bucket. It means he died. Sleep with. It means to have sexual intercourse with someone. Now we know this because these are common sayings within our culture. So we have this, we have the inside information. But somebody who's not familiar with our culture, uh, if you write that stuff down, and they're not familiar with the culture. And, and, and you know, some years from now they hit, they they read where he hit the sack. Well, what does that mean? You know, uh, why is it so important to hit the sack? You know, what did he attempt to gain by hitting the sack? Uh, or what 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 purpose is there to kick a bucket? See what I'm saying? And what I'm saying is that we have to understand that everything that we read in the Bible is not intended to be interpreted literally because some of them are similes, some of them are euphemisms, okay? So just as we use euphemisms in our everyday language, there are euphemisms in the Bible. I'm just gonna share with you a couple of them. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Now, some of these we can determine by the context, such as in Genesis 4 and 1. You know, and now Adam knew Eve, his wife. She conceived and bore Cain. So we know, you know, from that second phrase, and she conceived and bore Cain, we know that has something to do with him knowing Eve. So we can just deduct that knowing Eve means that he had sexual intercourse or he was intimate with his wife. Same thing in 1 Kings chapter four, uh, chapter three, chapter one rather, verse four. Uh, they, uh, David is getting old, he's getting sick. And this, this, is, one, <laughs> this is one of the ways they knew David was sick. Said that was a young man, a young woman was very beautiful. She was of service to the king and attended to him. And the king knew her not. In other words, he was not sexually aroused by her to the point that he had intercourse with her. So they knew, you know, he was, he was near the end. Okay. Let's look at another one. And this one may, may, it may not be so obvious. Because Saul went in to cover his feet. This is 1 Samuel 
chapter 24, verse 3. Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the side of the cave. Okay? Cover his feet. That's a euphemism. Uh, here's one we, we're very well familiar with, but we probably misinterpreted. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2. Seraphims were standing above him. Seraphim. Now, these, these fiery creatures are not regular angels, okay? Seraphims and cherubims are a different, different brand, different breed. They're not regular angels. Cherubims and the seraphims are the only creatures, are the only heavenly creatures in the Bible that have wings, that mention that, that specifically have wings. Regular angels. Listen to me now. Regular angels do not have wings. Only the cherubim and the seraphim are said to have wings. But anyway, seraphim were standing above him. That's the plural, by the way. Seraph would be the singular. Were standing above him. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew away. Two wings to veil my face. Two wings to veil my face. You know, we sing that song. But do we know what we're talking about? Do we know what we're talking about? You see, to cover his feet, we know when, when Saul went in the cave, Saul went in the cave to defecate, to have a bowel movement, to excrete. In our colloquial expression, Saul went in the cave to do number two. However, this reference to the seraphim covering his feet is a reference not to using the restroom, but is a reference to concealing the midsection of his body, the area of the genitals, not his actual feet. Okay. So, those wings covered his midsection, symbolized modesty, not his actual feet. But now, if you don't know, you don't know the euphemism, you'll miss that. There's also in the Bible hyperbole and exaggeration. Here are three examples, all by Jesus, all spoken by Jesus. Jesus used a lot of hyper uh, of exaggeration and hyperbole uh, to shock his listeners and to get his point across. He says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 through 30, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it's better for you to lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go to hell. Now, Jesus is not advocating that you mutilate yourself. In fact, if you mutilate yourself, it's still not going to solve your sin problem. Because, see, the problem is not with your eye, as far as lust is concerned. The problem is not with your eye. The problem is with your heart. But he's saying this for effect. He's saying that he's trying to imply, impress upon us or his, and to his original audience the importance, the severity, the magnitude, the importance of doing all you can to cut yourself off from sinful opportunities. That's what he's saying. Let's look, at, let's look at Luke 14, 26. And I hear this often. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus is not saying to hate your mother, 
I would hate your father. He said, he's not saying you need to hate people in order to be his disciple. He's saying that your love for him should be so strong that your love for your father, your love for your mother, your love for your wife, your love for your children, in comparison to your love for him and God would seem like hate in comparison. See, he used that to try to prove a point. Mark chapter 10, verse 24, B, 25. He says, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, people have you know, looked at this passage and, and supposedly talked about this, this, this gate in, in the wall uh, that's, that was called the eye of a needle where camels would kneel down and crawl through. No, Jesus was talking about a literal needle. He was stressing the impossible, the impossibility of man entering the kingdom of God on his own without God. That's all he was saying. Without God, it's impossible. In fact, he says that in the text. He says it's, it's impossible with man, but with God, all things are possible. That's all he's saying. So he used the exaggeration hyperbole to prove a point. Now you need to be aware of when you cross when you come across these uh, uh, linguistic uh, tools when you read the biblical text. As I said earlier, some things are not meant to be taken literally. He's not literally, he's not telling you to cut your eye, to cut off your eye, to cut out your eye. You know, pull out your arm, cut your arm off. That's not going to help you. <laughs> you got the situation in your heart. He's trying to illustrate and prove a point. Now, as you read the Bible, you need to be aware of the genre. Know the genre of what you read. And all the genre is just a $64,000 word. Uh, that means type of literature. That's all it means. If someone asks you, what, what genre is it? They ask you, what type of literature was it? Was it poem? You know, what, what was it? Prose, poetry, what? You know? So there are several, several different genres in the Bible. There's narrative. They're telling a story. There's law. You know, like the Ten Commandments, where God gives the law. <clears throat> There's poetry. There's prophecy, there's wisdom literature, such as in Proverbs. Uh, there's gospel, such as Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. There's history, first and second King, first and second Chronicles, Acts. There are letters called the epistles, the letters of Paul. And there's apocalyptic literature, such as Revelation and part of Daniel. And all of these, you have to read them for what they are. You can't, you can't read the law the same way you read the gospel. You can't read history the same way you read narrative. You can't read apocalyptic literature the same way you read poetry. You have to be aware of what you're reading, and that will give you an indication of how to interpret what you're reading. Now, in addition to that, there are also subgenres, such as parables, riddles, and sermons. And by the way, in parables, parables usually just have one meaning. And sometimes we're guilty of allegorizing. We try to put a meaning on everything in the parable. You know, Jesus is trying to tell a story. He has one really meaning he's trying to get us to see. And, this, you know, he's just filling out the story. There's not a message in every minute detail of the parable. Okay? So, like I said, they don't read the same. So, it's a mistake to read poetry, such as Psalms, in the same way, the Psalm rather, uh, the same way you read history or a narrative. And this is from uh, a great book called Grasping God's Word. It's kind of technical, but I, I suggest if you're really serious about 
Bible study and Bible interpretation, I, I suggest you get this book. Uh, I had it in my library, but I think I left it on my desk. Um, but it's called Grasping God's Word, a hands-on approach to reading, interpreting, and applying the Bible. It's by J. Scott Duvall and J. Daniel Hayes. And they say, for communication to occur, the reader must be on the same page as the author in terms of genre. How can we clarify the meaning of the ancient art authors when we are not around to feel, when they are not around rather, to feel our questions? The answer is literary genre. As Van Hooser puts it, when writing pulls asunder, what writing pulls asunder? Author, context, text, reader, genre pulls together. Even though the author and reader cannot have a face-to-face -face conversation, they meet in the text where they're able to communicate because they subscribe to a common set of rules, the rules of the particular genre. And by the way, we just stop there and tell you that the biblical authors were not idiots. They wrote, you know, just as we have, we have rules of grammar that we write by, they had rules of grammar. And they wrote according to those rules of grammar, syntax, subject verb form, and all that kind of stuff. They were familiar with that. Okay. Just as we, you know, we write certain style, certain context, certain form, so that everybody who reads can understand. Same thing back then. Okay. So they wrote according to the genre which they were writing. So he says, in this way, literary genre acts as a kind of covenant of communication, a fixed agreement between the author and reader about how to communicate. And in order for us to keep the covenant, we must let the author's choice of genre determine the rules we use to understand his or her word. To disregard literary genre in the Bible is to violate our covenant with the biblical author and with the Holy Spirit who inspired his message. So keep that in mind. Be aware of what the genre is that you're reading. And that will, that will help you determine how to interpret what you're reading. When you're reading apocalyptic literature, such as in, in, in Revelation, there's a different way to read Revelation than to read the Gospel of Matthew. You don't take everything in Revelation as, a, as, as literal because he's using symbols to make a point. You need to be aware of that. Now, one of my favorites is Hebrew poetry. And I was fascinated with this when I studied uh, Hebrew in, in school. The structure of Hebrew poetry um, is, is predicated on this, this uh, concept called parallelism. You see, while the main structure of a English poetry is rhyme, you know, Jack and Jill went up the hill. You know, you know it's a poet, a poem, because they rhyme, you know, the ending rhyme. Well, in Hebrew, just as we have rhyme, they have what's called parallelism. And in Hebrew parallelism, usually one thought is expressed by two lines of text, occasionally three, even four. And you need to be aware of this as you read the psalm and preachers as you preach the psalm, because I've heard, heard preachers preach the psalms who are not aware of this, and they, they, they bring in two meanings when really there's only one meaning because the author was saying one thing two different ways. For instance, we have Psalm here, number two, verse four. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. In this couplet, he who sits in the heaven and the Lord are parallel terms. In other words, he who sits in the heaven and the Lord the one who sits in the heavens in the first line and the Lord in the second line refer to the same personality. Not two different, the same one. 
There's also a parallel between last and in derision. Same basic thought. So the psalmist is using two lines to express one thought. Now, there are several different types of parallelism, such as synonymous. And that was a, an example of synonymous. He's saying the same thing two different ways. And then there's what is called developmental. And developmental is when you, uh, the second line is further developing the first line. And let me just, let me just turn here to Psalms 121 and three, because that gives us an example. It says, I'm reading for the New American Standard Bible. He will not allow your foot to slip. Okay, that's the first line. He who keeps you will not slumber. So he will not allow your foot to, to slip. That's the thought. He keeps you, okay? You're gonna slip, he, 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 he will not allow you to slip. Because he keeps you and he does what? He does not slumber. Okay? Then there's illustrative. Illustrative. Uh, there's an example of that in Psalms 140 and verse 7. Illustrative. Psalms 140, verse 7 says, O oh, oh God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation. Thou has covered my head in the day of battle. So covering his head, that's an illustration of how the Lord is his strength. And then there's constr constr contrasted, I'm sorry, where line B is contrasted with line A. And a uh, typical example of that is at the beginning of Psalm, Psalm verse one, I mean, verse Psalm number one and verse six. He says, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but there's a contrast, the way of the wicked shall perish. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but contrast, the way of the wicked shall perish. So you have all this going on with Hebrew poetry. So you need to be aware of that as you read the Psalm. Usually the psalmist, the author, when he when you have those lines of couplets there, he is saying one thing, and he's saying it two different ways, or he's saying one thing, and he's developing the thought in the second line. He's saying one thing, he's illustrating it in the second line. He's saying one thing, and then he's contrasting it with something else in the second line. So you need to be aware of that all that's going on when we read Hebrew poetry. So context is the key. Context is the key. Ignoring the surrounding context of a verse. And when I talk about the context, you know, I always say, if you want to get proper context, you need to read several verses before the verse you, you're centering on and several verses after to get a general feel of the immediate context. One of the things uh, that I cringe you know, I hear it because I hear it every day. You know, uh, there's so many songs out. Now I've heard preachers talk about it. eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard. What great thing God has prepared for those who love Him. Now that comes from, uh, you know, out of out of a, a, a letter of Paul. I think it's Romans, where he's quoting something from the Old Testament. But get this: there's a verse that comes right after they quit. They quit, they quit talking about it. The next verse says, but God has revealed them to us. And see, so when you go off and say about eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, and you ignore the but God, then you miss the point. When we ignore the surrounding context of a passage, of a verse or a passage, that leads to misinterpretation and misapplication. Here's a good one. Revelation 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and eat with me. Now this verse is often quoted as an invitation for sinners to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know, the doors of the church are open. Jesus said, if anybody 
you know, I'm standing at the door, knocking. If anybody open the door, I'm going to come in. And he's knocking at the door of the sinner's heart. That's what we say. But that's not what the verse is saying. It's not what the verse is saying. In the original context, you read it. Read the context. Part of the letters to the seven churches. He's not, this is not a picture of Jesus knocking at the door of a sinner's heart seeking entry. This is a picture of Jesus knocking on the door of his lukewarm church seeking entry. He's calling on the church, not sinners. He's calling on the church to repent when he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Here's my, here's my all time favorite John 10 10. Bless God. The thief comes only uh, to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundant. Now, so many preach and teach that the thief in this verse is the devil. However, if you just read the immediate context, you ain't got to go back all the way through. Just read the first, just the nine verses prior to verse 10 will give you the content. If you just started John uh, 10, 1, that will tell you who the thief is in John 10, 10. Because if you read it in context, you will discover that Jesus used the term the thief. He wasn't thinking about the devil. He was using the term the thief to, de to describe those false religious leaders who were standing right there in front of him. In fact, up, a, up a, you know, the verses before that, he says that all that came before me were thieves and robbers. So he uses thieves and robbers to refer to religious leaders. So why would he come all the way down to verse 10 and then talk about the devil? Strict out of context. We've just taken that verse and just ripped it out of his context and made it to say something it does not say. Something God never intended to decide. No, the thief in John 10:10, 10, 10, I said once, I will say it a thousand times. The thief in John 10:10 10, 10 is not the devil. The thief in John 10:10 10, 10 is the false religious leader and the religious system that robs you, kills your spirit. Now, that'll be a text that's not so popular. It's easy to pin it on the devil. See? So that's not what the text is saying. And let me give you a word about uh, 2 Timothy 2.15. We're getting ready to close, uh, wrap this up in a little bit. King James says, Steady to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly divided, the word of truth. Now, the, king, the word the King James translated as steady is a Greek word. It does not exactly mean the same as steady, as in studying for a test. He's talking about much more than that. He's, not, he's talking much more than just getting intellectual knowledge. The Greek word actually means to hasten, to exert oneself, to endeavor, to give diligence, to make every effort. See, we should not just read the Bible, but we should eagerly make every effort to be diligent so that we might accurately handle the word of truth. The thing that bothers me so bad is that many of us today, those who are handlers of the word, preachers and teachers, are too casual. You know, we, we, we're, not, we're, not, we're, not exhort, we're not exerting ourselves. We're not, we're not putting forth much effort to get to the real meaning of the text. We're just going about what other folks say. What we heard, what did we heard this preacher say, what we heard that teacher say. No, you need to learn how to study the word of God for yourself. Use all the tools that are at your disposal. If not, by all means, pray that the Holy Spirit will give you illumination. But let me just say this on that, on that, on that thing, that, that you cannot substitute the Holy Spirit for what you need to do. You see? Because help is needed. You know, you, you're not just going to pick up this Bible 
and read it and understand what you need to understand. Help is needed. An example of this, you know, we find it in Acts chapter 8, verse 30. It says Philip ran to him. You know, he got the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. He's on his way back home from Jerusalem. He's been wishing. Holy Spirit tells Philip, go join himself to that chair. And as Philip's doing that, uh, he hears this guy reading Isaiah. He asks him, he says, do you understand what you're reading? Here's the key. He said, how can I unless someone guides me? And it's amazing to me how people say, well, you know, I can read and study the Bible for myself. I don't need anybody to help. You know, because I got the Bible, I can read it myself. You got your textbook from school, but you need a teacher. Nobody's got a textbook from school and just read it and knew what they need to know. They know because there's something uh, that teacher teaches you how to read the textbook. So it is we're reading the Bible. Now, some people think all they need to correct the read and interpret the Bible is the Holy Spirit. But remember now, the job of the Holy Spirit is to indeed teach us, but we must be involved and we must do our part to be in position to be taught. Because remember now, the Bible was not written yesterday in America. Been thousands and thousands of years ago by several different authors across centuries of time in a different culture, in a different time, in a different language, in a different place, with a different worldview. And once you understand that, then the Holy Spirit can help you. Okay? By His grace, He helps you even before you understand all of that. But to get all you need to know, you need to study to show yourself approved. You need to make every effort to rightly divide the word of God. That's why we're in the shape being today. Because people have not learned how to correctly parse, how to correctly handle the word of God. And they're saying anything and everything. Because you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say simply by taking things out of context, ignoring the rules of grammar, ignoring the rules of what we talked about earlier about genre. See, all this comes into play to correctly, when, to, in order for us to correctly read and interpret the biblical text. So, it is only as we know what it meant to them that we can knowingly apply the biblical principles that are applicable to us. Now listen, there are things we're going through, there are issues we have now that they had no idea about. You know, for instance, uh, and this is, how, this is how you have to learn to, get the, to, to extract the principles. There's nowhere in the Bible where you're gonna find a verse that says, thou shall not smoke. People didn't smoke in those days. There were no cigarettes. There were no cigars. Thou shall not smoke. Not in there. But there is a principle in there where, where, the, where uh, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we are encouraged and we're commanded to take care of our body. And if smoking is harmful to our body, then we shouldn't be doing it. Or we shouldn't be doing anything to harm our body. Because your body is your only vehicle to do ministry in this world. Now, I know some of you want to check out and go to heaven, but listen, you're not doing God much good in heaven. He wants you here on earth to do his will. So to assign a meaning of what it means for or to us without the knowledge of what it meant for or to them is a gross violation of literary ethics in a total disregard for the original intent and meaning. Remember. Remember, it couldn't have meant one thing for them and something completely different for us. Now, sometimes when we read scripture, there's what we call the primary meaning, and then there are secondary meanings. 
But here's the issue. We violate the text when we make the secondary meaning the primary meaning. You first have to find out what it meant to them. What was in the mind of the author? What did he intend? What did he mean when he wrote this? How did the people who he wrote it to, how did they receive his message? How did they understand or understood what he meant? And then we extract the principles from that and apply it to our modern day situation. But we can't extract the principles until we know what they meant in the original context. And the only way to do that now is that we cannot dictate to them what they intended. We can't say, well, that's what I think it said. No, we have to allow them to speak for themselves. Amen. Well, listen, I pray and hope this this is this uh, video has been a blessing to you. And if it has been a blessing to you, it will be a blessing to someone else. Share it on your timeline. God bless you. Hope to see you uh, tomorrow night or hear from you tomorrow night. We'll have our prayer line tomorrow night. I didn't share that number with you. Tonight I was um, missed it, but uh, we have our prayer line. Well, let me just pull it up right quick so you can see it right quick. Uh, call in tomorrow night for our prayer line. That's the New Hope uh, prayer line. Call in. That's every Thursday from 7 p.m. until 7:30 p.m. That's Eastern Standard Time, and that number is 774-220-40. Two zero. That's seven seven four two two zero four zero two zero, and the access code is three seven two one one three seven. Followed by the pound sign. Call in. We'd love to hear from you. God is doing some great things with that prayer line, and we just praise God for the medium of prayer. We thank God for all of you who've been sharing in it, and hopefully you'll, if you haven't, you'll call in and join us on tomorrow evening. God bless you. Until the next time. May the Lord bless you real good is our prayer.